Okay guys, so this is the uh, the new normal now, so hopefully this will go. We're gonna be talking about the uh, the Wittig reaction. It's a, it's a pretty handy reaction. It allows us to form alkenes, but we don't form alkenes via an elimination reaction. We're gonna be forming alkenes using either an aldehyde or a ketone. plus what is known as an organophosphorus, where I have a positively charged, actually, let me do this in a different color, where I have a positively charged, I'm sorry, I have three phenyl rings attached to a positively charged phosphorus atom next to a carbanion and either an RH, or a different R, the same R, or hydrogen here, okay? This is referred to as a Wittig reagent. And in addition to being a Wittig reagent, it's also referred to as an illid. An illid is a species where you have a positive and a negative charge next to each other, and all atoms have octets. So that's just a little bit of additional nomenclature to go with all the other nomenclature that you've been taught so far. So the product of this is a chemical reaction where I will add the carbonyl carbon here, will act as an electrophile, okay? This negatively charged carbon atom will act as a nucleophile, and my new alkene will look like this. I have a brand new double bond. Hopefully you guys can see that. So let me use a different color. New double bond formed between the alkene or aldehyde and the salt called illid. And the byproduct of this is this phosphonium species that is soluble in aqueous solution. So as you know, this is an organic chemistry lab. So having these species soluble in aqueous solution makes the extraction and the isolation of our, of our product, okay, desirable, okay? And so again, why is this so handy? Well, we know already that currently the only way we know how to make alkenes is via E1 or E2, okay? And so if I were to take so-called 2-bromobutane, okay, I would have treated it in the presence of a large sterically hindered base, potassium, uh, I'm sorry, uh, potassium tert oxide. I would get two products. I would get the major so-called Zaitsev product, and I would get another minor product, okay? And the reason this is the major product is because, of course, I have what? I have the more highly substituted alkene, helps to stabilize the dipole, okay? And so this is the major product. In addition to being the major product, I'm only going to form the trans product, okay? This is due to what? Well, we have the stereochemistry here where I have my leaving group has to be 180 degrees away from my beta hydrogen that's being eliminated, okay? And I could represent this by using a Newman projection and so I could put my bromine here if I wanted to. I could put my hydrogen here if I wanted to. And the most likely place for my two methyls would be here and here. And so other hydrogens, okay? And so my base, of course, would come in, remove this proton, form my double bond, and kick off my leaving group, okay? Because of the way the orbitals have to align, okay, it just so happens that these two methyl groups Okay, 
most likely being the lowest energy conformer will be 180 degrees from each other, which is why our major highly substituted product is mostly trans, okay? And so again, the Wittig reaction is handy because what can we do with the Wittig reaction? Well, I can take an alkene. I'm sorry, I can form an alkene. I could form a so-called Z isomer or cis isomer. I could selectively form a terminal alkene. And this could be done by using formaldehyde as my carbonyl compound plus this organophosphate, I'm sorry, this organophosphorus, rather, species here. Oops, sorry. This particular illid would give me this particular alkene here. All right, and so again, it's very handy because again, it allows us some stereospecificity and allows us to form the so-called, I'm sorry, minor product, which is referred to as the Hoffman elimination product. And we'll be talking about that later on in the semester. Okay, so what are we gonna be doing? Well, what we're gonna be doing, or what you guys are gonna be watching, what we already did, okay, is we're gonna be taking benzaldehyde, which is this guy right here. Okay, so again, this is one of my favorite compounds because of its smell, okay? We're gonna be treating this, okay, with an illid that is referred to as benzyl triphenyl phosphonium chloride. Now, this is not an activated illid here because what I don't have is I don't have this hydrogen here that's been deprotonated. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use a catalytic amount of sodium hydroxide. Now this is a catalytic amount of sodium hydroxide. In other words, you do not include this in your limiting reagent calculation because it is a catalyst. Okay, and so the product of this is going to be my new double bond. Okay, I'm gonna form two products. I'm going to form what is called the so-called Z stilbene. And stilbene is just another functional group name when you have a double bond flanked by two phenyl rings. And I'm also going to form the so-called E, still being. Now we are gonna get a combination of both the E and the Z, but in this particular reaction, the Z still being is going to be our major. And so that's what makes this reaction so unique. Okay, so when you watch the video, you're gonna watch us go through this and we're gonna be prepping the so-called illid. Okay, and so the reaction is gonna take place in a couple of steps. The first thing we're gonna do is prep and form the illid. We're going to start with benzyl triphenyl phosphonium chloride, okay? Or you may refer to it as BTC in your lab report. It's benzyl, okay, which is this portion right here, triphenyl, which is, of course, this portion right here, phosphonium, oops, which is this portion right here, and then of course chloride will be the counter agent, which I'm not, or counter ion, which I'm not gonna write. CH, um, shoot. Which I'm not gonna write when I do the mechanism. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna add sodium hydroxide, okay? 
Sodium hydroxide will remove this proton right here, and this is how we form our ilid. The pKa of that proton is exceptionally low. It has a pKa of about 11 or 12, depending on which particular um, uh, organophosphorus molecule is. But what we're going to do is we're going to form this guy here, and the reason that so-called beta hydrogen, I'm sorry, not beta hydrogen, benzyl hydrogen has such a low pKa is because my ilid is what? Okay, it's resonance stabilized. And so that makes it exceptionally easy for us to remove, so easy that we can use a relatively weak base. And so these two species right here will be resonance forms with each other. Okay, once we do that, okay, and you'll see this form during the course of the chemical reaction, okay, we're going to be adding sodium hydroxide to the reaction mixture, and it's going to go from being a white color to a very light yellow color. And the reason it turns yellow is because this is conjugated. Okay, even though phosphorus has exceeded its octet, we can still resonate across this entire species. Remember, phosphorus is a period three element, so it can accept up to, well, 10 electrons in the case of phosphorus. Okay, so now that we've prepped our ILID, and now we made this, I'm gonna go ahead and show you how we do the nucleophilic attack of the carbonyl compound, okay? We're gonna start with benzaldehyde, which I'm going to draw in a different color. This is benzaldehyde, and we know that it's electrophilic because I have a dipole going through this carbonyl bond. I'm going to react it in the presence of my ILID and you don't have to do this in separate colors. Obviously, this is me teaching. And just like before, you can show it from nucleophilic attack from either the carbanion. Oops, there should be no negative, or there should be no charge there, or the neutral um, resonance form. It doesn't matter. So I'm going to take my negative charge here. Ooh, oh, son of a bitch. Okay, I'm going to take my negative charge here, nucleophilic attack. Okay, and I'm going to break my carbonyl bond. This is going to give me this intermediate species that has this form like this. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna keep all my colors the same, okay? And so I'm gonna draw my oxygen oxide rather here, okay? I'm gonna draw, draw my phosphorus here, my hydrogen here, okay? I'm gonna show my new bond in blue I'll show my new bond in blue. Then I'm going to show where this carbon atom was added over here. So here, okay. The phosphorus here, which now we're gonna show as a positively charged species, is still bonded to these three phenyl rings, okay? And so, Remember that this is kind of tetrahedral-ish, okay? And, oops, there's also a hydrogen and another phenyl over here that I'm going to draw here. And I'm gonna draw the other hydrogen. There's a hydrogen here, I can't remember, okay? It's going to then form the cyclic species that is referred to as an oxophosphatan. Okay, again, oops, that's a P, that's a hydrogen. Okay, so again, I'm gonna draw my new bond in blue. I'm gonna draw the new bond between the oxygen and the phosphorus in blue. There's a phosphorus atom here, okay. It's still bonded to the original carbon in the illet over here. The three fiddle rings here, okay. This fiddle group here and this hydrogen here. So this is referred to as an oxophosphatan. All right, so this is an intermediate species that will then break the phosphorus carbon bond here, the oxygen carbon bond here, form a new double bond here, okay? I'm sorry, form a new double bond here, 
and then a new double bond between the oxygen and the phosphorus. This reaction step is concerted, or so we think. Okay. And what I'm going to get is a combination. Oops, come on. Oh, hold on, I gotta add a page. Okay. And what I'm going to You gotta be kidding me. Sorry, slight difficult difficulty, technical difficulties there. Um, anyways, and so what we're gonna get is we're gonna get a combination, okay, of my still being where the phosphor, I'm sorry, the phenyl group from the benzaldehyde will be on one side of the ring. My new double bond will be here. And this phosphorus group right here, I keep saying phosphorus, I mean phenyl. And this phenyl group could either be here or what I could get would be this here. Yeah, this must be brutal to watch and I do apologize for that. My TAs are much better at using this than I am. Okay, so I can either have the Z or the E still be. Okay, and so those are gonna be our two products. And so we're actually gonna form both. And we're gonna isolate a mixture. And so this is really important because when you look at the NMR that I'm going to be sending out to you guys, you're gonna have a combination of both of the products, okay? And so don't interpret your NMR as assuming that you're gonna get one or two of these. And the way we're gonna interpret these NMRs is this, these two sets of protons, which are identical, okay, have a much higher chemical shift than these two sets of protons over here. And so I'll talk about that when we get there, okay? All right, so one of the things that we need to look at is we're gonna be doing a reaction, okay? So we did this in a conical vial, okay? We did a little condenser, okay? And so we're gonna be refluxing water in, water out. And so when the reaction is over, this is what we could possibly have, okay? This is what we could possibly have. We could have in our reaction mixture, And have two levels or two layers rather. We're doing this reaction in DCM, which has a density of 1.35 grams per mil. Okay, and so it's going to be under our so called aqueous layer. Okay, so like I said, the handy thing about this is the, the, uh, the organophosphate is going to be in the aqueous layer, maybe if we have any more unreacted BTC, that will also be in the aqueous layer because remember, it's ionic, so it's gonna go into the aqueous layer. Here, I'm going to have my still beans. Oops. But I'm also gonna have some leftover benzaldehyde. And so, we could do a couple of things. Okay, we can't do extraction because why? There is no way we could selectively ionize benzaldehyde, okay? We could do a column, sure that would work. Um, we can't do a recrystallization because the melting points of these two um, still beans are so different from each other. There's about a difference of about 80 degrees. So we couldn't selectively isolate one of these two still beans over the benzaldehyde. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use a chemical extraction. And so, obviously, we're just going to get rid of this aqueous layer, okay? We're just going to get rid of it, okay? And then what we're going to do is we're going to take our organic layer and we're going to wash it with sodium bisulfite, okay? 
And so again, I've got my two still beans. I'm just going to use these little abbreviations as fennel rings. Okay. I'm going to have my DCM mixture here. Okay. And I'm going to have benzaldehyde. And one of the washes we're going to be doing is using a saturated sodium bisulfite. So N A H S O three solution. Okay. And we're going to do this because what will happen is bisulfite has this structure here. Oops, I put in one too many H's. Okay, has this structure here. Okay, and this is actually a nucleophile. And for reasons that I don't have time to get into, okay, this oxygen atom is the most nucleophilic. I'm sorry, oxygen atom's not the most nucleophilic. It's the, uh, it's a lone pair here on the sulfur atom, okay? It's gonna react, again, with the benzaldehyde. We have nucleophilic attack of benzaldehyde here. And I'm going to form what is referred to as a Lewis adduct. And so this is just some plain Jane, um, Lewis acid, Lewis based chemistry, okay? The sulfur atom will be attached to that carbon right here. This oxygen atom, which was formerly the carbonyl oxygen atom, will remain negative. Phosphorus, I'm sorry, phenyl, hydrogen. Sulfur will still have this negative oxygen, positive, I'm sorry, neutral oxygen and hydroxyl group. But now that it has five bonds and it's a group um, six, element, it's positively charged as well. And so what we have here is we have one, two, three sites, okay? And this species, I'm sorry, three sites that are ionic. And so this species right here, okay, will go into the aqueous phase. And so once we add this saturated sodium bisulfite solution, what we're gonna have then is we're going to have two layers again, aqueous, and we're going to have our Lewis adduct, okay, down here, and up here, or down, I'm sorry, up here, and then down here, we're going to have our so-called still beans, okay, which will allow us to remove this and leave us only with the E and Z isomer of the still beans, in case you're wondering, this equals this. All right, so we're going to go ahead and do that. Okay, we are going to do that for you. You're going to watch how we do that. We're going to do a saturation test. Okay, saturation test with bromine. If I take an alkene and I add Br2, I'm going to get transbromination, but that's not what's important. This is a qualitative test. In other words, we're not going to be doing any calculations. We're not going to be running any spectroscopy. But what we're going to see is we're going to see this orange color for the bromine disappear and this vicinal dihalide is colorless, okay? And so it's gonna be the disappearance of the bromine color that we're gonna appreciate as a positive test, okay? The second saturation test we're gonna do is the potassium permanganate test, where we're gonna take potassium KMnO4, we're gonna react it in the presence of this alkene, and in this case, we're gonna get a syn diol, which again is irrelevant to what we're actually doing. What is important, however, is that when manganese goes from a plus seven oxidation state, it's purple, okay, to the byproduct of this, which is manganese four oxide, okay, this is brown. You change the oxidation state of a species, you change the electronic structure, and ergo, it's a different color, okay? And so, again, you're going to comment on these and say, hey, they were positive, because I told you they were positive when we were making the video. And so you're going to make sure that you're going to mention these, okay, right here. These need to be in your observations, okay. And in your discussion, okay. 
All right. And so what we're going to email out to you guys is an NMR. Okay, we're going to email the NMR out. And we're going to be sending you nice, clean NMRs. And what is important is you be able to identify, oops, I don't know why I did that. Well, you would be able to identify the ratio of Z to E. Okay. And the way we're going to do that is by looking at the chemical shifts of these so-called vanillic protons on these two different compounds, these two different isomers of each other, and they're very different. Okay. These protons right here coming off the E isomer. Okay. Oops. Ah, come on. Ah. Coming off the E isomer. Ooh. Hold on. These protons here and here. Okay. These are highly deshielded. Okay. More so than we're going to see here. So these are this proton here. And those are going to be the only two sets of protons that are going to be integrated on your NMR. Okay. And so we take a look at these protons here. These are not as deshielded. Okay. They're not as close to the actual ring current because the ring current is coming this way. So they're actually kind of pushed out away from the ring current. Whereas these two protons are getting the ring current from either one of these phenyl rings. Okay. And so these are more deshielded because they're, they're feeling the effect of both of the ring currents. Whereas these are more shielded because they're not really feeling the full effect of the ring current from these two phenyl rings. And so you're going to look at this number right here and you're going to get the ratio for your percent yield of each isomer. Okay, and so how do you do that? Well, you get a ratio, which means you need to figure out the fraction of each one of these isomers. I keep, oh my God, I'm gonna, no, I don't wanna add a caption. Ah, yeah. All right, so what do we have? Okay, so these are the integrals. So we have 0.99 of my E, and we have 1.550, rather, of my Z. Now, these are not percentages. These are relative ratios, so what we need to do is we need to turn these into fractions, okay? And so, for the actual yield, so say, I'm gonna give you an actual yield. So say your actual yield, oops, actual yield, is, I don't know, I'm just making this number up, 0 0.800 grams, okay? So that's the number that's gonna be assigned to you, okay? And so we need to figure out what our fraction of E is. So our fraction of E is gonna be 0 0.99 divided by 1.5 plus 0 0.99. So what is it? It's the part divided by the total. Now we're, we're not getting percent, so don't multiply it by 100. And so let me do this real quick. And so this is going to give you 0.3976, okay? And so, again, you're going to do the exact same thing for the Z isomer, okay? And so this is going to be 1.50 divided by 1.5. Hold on, I'm running out of room here. divided by 1.5 plus 0 0.99. And this is going to be equal to 0 0.6024, okay? And so you're gonna take these numbers and you're gonna multiply them times your actual yield, 0 0.800 times 0 0.8, I'm sorry, 0 0.800, okay? And then you're gonna get some value, which I probably should have, let me again, scoot this over. God, I miss my chalkboard. And frankly, I kind of miss you guys. I don't know about you guys, but I'm not really liking this whole quarantine thing. I'm a extrovert, so I need people. All right, so you're gonna do this calculation. So times 0.8. So 
you're going to get 0 0.481 nine grams okay of your z isomer you're going to do the same thing 0 0.3976 times 0 0.8 okay and this is going to give you 0 0.3181 grams of your e isomer okay and again you're going to use btc which is a solid so you're going to go mass to moles, okay? Remember your theoretical yield is the same for both. Oops. Both isomers, okay? And so for your benzaldehyde, I don't know if you can hear, but my neighbors have been partying basically since the, um, <laughs> since the quarantine. Good for them. You're going to use however many mils it is. I don't remember. I think it's 0.2. So you're going to use 0 0.2 mils of benzaldehyde, but you're going to need to go density. Then you're going to use the molar mass, and then you're going to go to moles. Okay, so there's going to be one additional calculation in here for the benzaldehyde. I know we're going to use the sodium hydroxide. No, we are not. Why aren't we using the sodium hydroxide? because it is a catalyst, okay?